energy and climate and energy access at the United Nations Foundation. Um, it's a pleasure to have such a distinguished panel this morning um, to help us reflect and discuss on um, how societies can con contribute to the implementation of women's rights to access and control their natural resources. Um, because we are starting slightly late this morning, I'd just like to kick off uh, the session immediately. Um, and uh, since he has just indicated that he's in a minority of one, we'd like to start the session by calling on um, uh, Prime Minister Al Mahdi uh, of Sudan to talk a little bit about some of the best practices um, he has seen from his time uh, in Sudan and perhaps reflecting on uh, women's issues more generally in an international context. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Dear lady, <laughs> I have to mind my language. Um, the, uh, this important topic uh, calls, I think, for also important perceptions. I kick off by a short introduction that uh, natural resources are land, water, livestock, forests, extractive commodities, and the atmosphere. People exploit them for their vital necessities, for infrastructure, for social and security services, for the market. Uh, the optimum exploitation requires optimum occupation of the human resources. Therefore, I have the following seven points to make. First point, women constitute at least 50% of populations However, they have value added that makes a qualitative increase in their input. They are more cautious in handling matters, more law-abiding, indispensable for child care. They have a logic which could be contrasted with our logic of being water rather than rock logic. And we believe through this, they make tremendous contribution to the human endeavor. My second point, catering for women's rights requires, I believe, belief in the human rights agenda, the CEDAW agreement, resolutions like 1325. However, in spite of the fact that this is now universally accepted, the problem is there are cultural constraints that make this position, which is universally acknowledged, impossible to implement. The cultural factors may block reform. In Sudan, we were lucky enough, even traditionally minded people accepted women education a hundred years ago. Political rights were all meted for women in 1964 voting, uh, election, and all the different political rights. But cultural factors, cultural factors have been very powerful in blocking the realization of women's empowerment. My fourth point is that the cultural iron curtain, which I call the cultural iron curtain, has been so powerful that even educated women 
tend to reflect such reactionary ideas. I have met with resistance from educated women advocating women empowerment. For instance, a graduate called Fat Mouth Man challenged my talk about equality as recognizing he believes that traditional Muslim values reject this kind of position. Another, Aisha Gubshawi, a doctor also, who challenged when I said that human beings come from the same stock divided between two, so that it's as if min wahida, that is, we are all, we come from one self that was divided into male and female. And this is the Quranic description. However, she said, no, we are created from the rib of Adam, which is of course uh, something referred to in some of the alleged prophet sayings, but that's what she insisted on and contradicted me. We were talking on the air that she wanted us all to believe that they have been created from the ribs, the rib of Adam. Another lady, Dr. Mahasin, she challenged what I was saying against female mutilation and saying that this was against our culture, against our religion. And in fact, she was arguing with me and I couldn't see who she was because she was all covered in her face and everything because she believes that this is the proper Islamic position for a woman, that they may, may, must all be completely covered, which is also un-Islamic, but that is uh, how she thought about the matter. Therefore, I engaged in a campaign of advocacy that led me to a numerous works. A book I called The Rights of Women, Human and Islamic Compare and Contrast, in which I uh, proved that there is no contradiction between them. A book that I wrote after that about punishments in Islam, which also maintained, because there are many laws that are expected to deal with women differently from men. And I argued for equality before the law. Another book on the reference for a modern reference for Islamic thinking. A third, fourth book about uh, my belief that al insan bunyanullah, that man or woman, human beings are the masterpiece creation of God. Their rights are uh, sacrosanct. A book called Ayyuh uh, Hajil, addressing all the youth in terms of female equality and so on. Several lectures, some of which one in Geneva dealt with the, I believe, consistency between Islamic basic authentic principles and the declaration, the universal declaration of human rights. Also another one on the consistency between Islamic principles and SIDAW. And practically, I brought up my children who are 10, six girls, four boys, to be colorblind in terms of gender discrimination. And they have grown in this spirit so that my girls, my daughters, have performed very well as citizens, as Muslim ladies and so on, without the old prejudices that constrain women in our society. Also, in my party, which I lead, and the religious organization which I lead, I have insisted on quotas for women empowerment. And this started 10%, 15%, 20%, now it's 25%. And it is developing into more and more 
until I hope we reach parity. My fifth point, the phenomenon of Islamic assertion, which is now all over the Muslim world, is partly nostalgia for an idealized past, but I believe more so an expression of resistance against injustices, internal injustices and external injustices. For instance, imperialism, for instance, the rape of Palestine, and so on. So many issues are so important in the fueling of this Islamic assertion. The Islamic assertion now has a broad spectrum between what I call Erdogan in the left and Taliban in the right. And between them, we have this broad spectrum of Islamic expression of Islamic assertion. However, the irony now, as we will see, as you will see now in all post-Arab Spring countries, the irony is that more freedom is leading to less shared society. And this is very important because it means that it defeats the purpose. You have democracy, you have freedom, you have elections, but then you have powers which do not welcome and accept the idea of shared society. My sixth point, there are all seven points. My sixth point is that there is a now a tragic schism in our civilization, a very tragic schism between those who claim or for stick to identity however express identity in many ways in anachronistic terms and those who seek modernization however they express it in terms that are rootless so we get this irony between anachronism and rootlessness and this is a very uh, serious ironic polarization The imperative in this respect is the need for a synthesis. The need for a synthesis. A synthesis does, does not express reform in terms outside the cultural norms. Because any such expression outside the cultural norms will only lead to greater reaction. And the reaction will then mean that the idea of identity will be polarized, will be monopolized by the reactionaries. So what we need is a synthesis that would legitimize reform. In this respect, I say yes for education, but what's the content of this education? This is another problem. The content of this education in many ways is reactionary. And therefore, there needs to be an, what I call cultural revolution that should change the norms of the educational programs. Yes, for positive action. However, even if you empower women who have this background of cultural reaction, they will take their office but express reactionary ideas, as I have suggested. Yes, for legislation, which we have done, as I say, quite some time ago in Sudan, 1964. But the need is essential to clear the cultural deck. Without clearing the cultural deck, removing this cultural iron curtain, all the legislation, all the good ideas about empowerment will not be fulfilled. If we go to the original Islamic message, it is clear that when the Prophet وسلم, started the mission, he started with a cultural revolution. The Quran came before legislation. So it prepared the ground for the change. Even in the West, all this modern, modern civilization has been preceded by a cultural revolution in terms of the enlightenment. It is the enlightenment which broke the ground broke the ground for 
the changes that took place later. So it is necessary we concentrate on the need for this cultural, cultural reformation. My final point, the seventh point, is about recommendations. I believe that this encounter should not end by simply making a nice diagnosis and separate it or separate prognosis or um, any such, uh, uh, I believe, scattered input. And therefore, I suggest the following recommendations to be part and parcel of our endeavor this morning or in the two days sessions. The first one is that we should recommend and say that optimum exploitation of natural resources for human welfare demands full employment of human resources. Second point, yes for education, legislation, positive action, but cultural enlightenment is an imperative. Third point, all cultures and religions are required, should address the human rights agenda. There is no point, I believe, in bilateral dialogue between religions and cultures. What is needed is for each religion, each culture, to update itself in terms of human rights. And that would make, would draw them closer, irrespective of any kind of discussions or dialogue bilaterally. The next point, the uh, an index of compliance must be established. The Club of Madrid and its allies should be thinking in terms of this index of women empowerment to be updated every year. Next point, there are two modernist attitudes which I think should be banished in the interest of reform. One of them, because they supply the reactionary forces with ammunition. They are the commoditization, the commoditization of women or the commoditization of beauty. Now beauty is a very beautiful thing, a very nice thing, but it is being commercialized in a way which is very destructive. If you want to sell a car, you get a half naked lady, if you, whatever you want to do. This is counterproductive because it tends to enhance the image of women being the body rather than any other thing. This must be resisted. And I don't know how this can be resisted because it is very popular in terms of advertisements and the media and so on, but it is something that is counterproductive for women's rights because it tends to depict women in terms of a consumable commodity. And this is very bad and unacceptable. The second thing, is that the linkage between women's rights and, which is justifiable, the gender balance which is justifiable, with controversial subjects like same-sex marriage. Now this is something that offers the reactionaries tremendous ammunition to go against the, this phenomenon. Therefore, we have to be quite conscious of the fact that this is in fact irrelevant. It may be relevant in other societies, but for us, uh, facing this child's heel with women's rights, we can do away with this particular uh, aspect. Uh, second point, or the seventh point, or sixth point about this, uh, in the recommendations, we should advocate development, economic development, post the GDP, model, which would involve the social aspect, which would involve uh, the gender aspect, which would involve the environment, which would involve the, a, a comprehensive human development, rather than simply the GDP as a, an index for development. Then the need for a UN forum for follow-up, because there are so many good ideas that suffer from full many a flower. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air. This particular phenomenon 
has to be countered. And therefore, we need a forum for follow-up and accountability to bridge the gap between rhetoric and practice. Final point about this recommendation, the code of the Club of Madrid and associates, because now the Club of Madrid has grown into a phase of looking around for brothers and sisters and cousins in terms of what we have as common aims and targets. Uh, I call now the Club of Madrid, Club of Madrid, Club of Madrid Plus, to create a network to expose the gender deficit and advocate the gender balance. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, what, a, what a wonderful way to kick off uh, this morning's discussion with such a broad-ranging um, set of uh, uh, recommendations as well as um, uh, a, a broad-ranging view of some of the impediments for uh, women's empowerment and uh, particularly focusing some of the cultural aspects of, uh, of how we sometimes limit ourselves as women as well in terms of really realizing our full capacity for um, utilizing the natural resources um, as well as our own human resources to uh, really foster sustainable development. So, Mary Robinson um, needs no introduction. I, I think uh, uh, we have all had the benefit of her wisdom um, uh, in the past and over the course of the last uh, several days as well. Um, perhaps you could take up uh, the mantle from here and talk more from your experience and particularly just coming out of, of Doha, I know, um, around some of your um, perspectives around uh, perhaps the, the the, the, the more legislative aspects of how we can really be um, helping to uh, enforce and implement women's rights. So um, perhaps you could just give us a perspective on some of the most current applications of, of where you're working in this area. Okay, thank you very much, Roshenda, and good morning. I'm delighted to follow from uh, my friend Prime Minister Al-Mahdi uh, with a, a strong emphasis, as he did, on uh, the human rights approach, uh, because uh, that's what brings me to uh, the issue of uh, resources, and in particular, in this context, food security, uh, food and nutrition security. Uh, I think it's important in this part of the world that we take more seriously that important stream of rights that we call economic and social rights, rights to food and safe water, health, education, participation, voice, um, as human rights, not as political aspirations, but as rights that governments have signed up to and have committed to progressively realize without discrimination, and that they need to be held to account by their civil society for that commitment, and they need to be, that needs to be very much part of the approach. I'm going to be quite brief so that we have time for the other speakers and for the audience, because I can see some very knowledgeable people um, in the audience. So I'll really keep the focus on the uh, way in which we're trying to approach uh, food and uh, nutrition security and realize that if you take, for example, um, the situation in sub-Saharan Africa, about 70% or more of the farmers are women, but they own 2% of the land. So there's a huge disconnect between the work that's done and access to credit, access to the resource of land itself. So we have a big um, issue there to address. And um, what uh, we are trying to do in my um, foundation on climate justice is to ensure that the gender dimensions of food and nutrition security are brought out in the various ways in which we're working on this. And uh, one of them is I'm involved in the lead group of the UN Scale Up Nutrition. And I have to say that unless a few of us had insisted on a task force on gender as part of the UN Scale Up Nutrition, it wouldn't have happened. You might think it's obvious, but sometimes you have to uh, actually work at these things. Now, gender is very well integrated into the Scale Up Nutrition, and I think that that uh, will help greatly. Um, the, uh, there is going to be an important conference in Dublin um, in April, which is part of um, Ireland having the EU presidency for the first six months um, of 2013. Um, we are joining with the Irish government, with the World Food Programme, and with part of SIGIAR on a conference on f hunger, nutrition,
climate justice. And it won't be the usual presidency of the EU top-down conference. It's actually going to be a bottom-up listening conference where those who are involved on the ground in providing food security, food and nutrition security, um, come and share their experience. There'll be a lot of South-South learning experience that we will benefit from. And we will have the EU presidency leaders coming to listen and others coming, some heads of state and that, but they're coming to listen to those who know what the issues are with a big challenge. We know that it is small scale food and nutrition security, which is vital. How do we scale up? And part of what we're trying to do, and I think this would particularly interest you, uh, Rishenda, because of your work in the UN Foundation, we believe that a link must be made to access to energy. Um, and the way I tell that is in, in, in the context, for example, of social protection systems. Um, how do we scale up dramatically and address the unmet needs for energy, the 1.3 billion people in our world today out of a, a world of 7 billion who, who don't have access to electricity, who um, uh, use kerosene and candles, who pay far too much for energy, but they don't prioritize energy because they have so many other priorities. And even more startling, and I think actually shameful as a statistic, and I know that the Cook Stove Alliance is, is working on this, is 2.6 billion out of our 7 billion who still cook on charcoal, firewood, animal dung, and ingest indoor fumes. There was a recent article in The Lancet which shows that the health imp impacts are far worse than we thought. It's about four million a year die. Uh, so far more women die of inhaling indoor fumes um, than die of malaria. And yet we have increasingly different types of clean cook stoves. So how do we scale up that access to energy to free up women, free up their time to have light in the home for school children, to change the lives of the very poorest. And I'll just give you this example and then I'll stop there so that others can, can participate. And we brought together uh, those who provide access to energy gadgets, if I put it that way, clean energy gadgets, um, with those who work in social protection systems. We brought them together in Picantico with support from the uh, Rockefeller Brothers Foundation. And we came out with some really good recommendations um, about using government social protection systems in poor countries. And the example that I want to um, uh, give you, because I've seen a little bit of it, and we'll see it again when I'm in Addis in January, is the Ethiopian social safety net system. It's a big Ethiopian government scheme covering about 8 million people throughout um, parts of Addis, but mainly rural Ethiopia. And although it's a government scheme, it is the donors that um, USAID, DFID, um, German aid, Irish aid, etc., and a lot of NGOs who provide how this scheme works. It's a productive scheme, so people work an extra day, I think it's a day a month, and then they get a cash voucher or a goat or some chickens. I was reminded of it when we were in the Heifer Institute. And, and that seems good, but to me it's extraordinary that they don't get energy. And you know, here they are, we know who they are, we know they're the poorest. Why can't we have some modeling um, of providing scaled up access? We could perhaps reach five or six million um, in, in a relatively short time of the eight million if we, with clean coke stoves, with light in the home, with mobile phones, with the kind of thing that will change their lives. So this to me is, and, and then we have to um, have a gender perspective on that as well, but I won't go into that at the moment. So these are the kind of issues that I think we need to be addressing in this context of women's rights and access to, to resources. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mary, for those comments. Um, and, and, and you mentioned the, 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 the goats and the chickens, and in fact, um, chickens lay more eggs if they have light as well in the poultry houses. So it's not only about access to light for the household, but it's also more productive in terms of providing additional income for families as well. And electricity is good for family planning. Absolutely. So. Um, <laughs> We, we, we are working with many others actually before the, uh, the next World Cup uh, soccer um, in 2014 to really be able to help provide um, uh, televisions. Um, now you can get a, a 12 or 13 watt television that um, before was, was unthinkable. Um, so the cost of some of these solutions is really coming down. And uh, for those who say that um, 
energy services are too expensive for the poor. I think we have so many stories now that in show, in fact, that uh, particularly renewable energy solutions are extremely affordable for the poor if you base it on the cash that they're already paying for their lighting and uh, um, cooking and the externalities that they're paying in terms of the cost to their health and their children's education. So that's a, that's a wonderful um, segue to move now to introduce uh, the rest of our panel. Um, and I'd like to start um, with uh, uh, some comments from Madam Alimata Traore, who is the president of COFERSA in, uh, in Mali. As Mary was talking about the, the need for bottom-up um, perspectives and uh, solutions, and she's going to be talking a little bit about her experience um, in Mali, working and leading a farmer association, um, and talking about how tangibly women can be utilizing uh, their land and really owning uh, their right to the natural resources. So, uh, Madame Traore, uh, your perspective, please. Merci. Je m'appelle Almata Traore. J'ai 39 ans. Je suis la présidente de la Convergence des femmes et rurales pour la souveraineté alimentaire. We'll just wait if, if you need a headset. There, there are people who are giving out the headsets right now. So um, um, please, please continue. D'accord. J'ai dit, je m'appelle Alimata Traoré. Je suis la présidente des femmes rurales pour la souveraineté alimentaire au Mali. J'ai 39 ans. J'ai été élevée dans un village au Mali qui est à 200 km au sud du Mali, la ville de Sikassou. Donc, j'ai travaillé permanemment avec les femmes rurales. Donc, on faisait tout ce qui est euh, du rôle de la femme rurale au niveau des plantations et de la culture. Donc, j'ai appris toutes mes connaissances au niveau des de femmes rurales jusqu'à bas, à bas âge. Et l'important, c'est que les femmes rurales ont au niveau de l'agriculture. J'ai compris tout ça en travaillant avec eux. Et puis, euh, le problème qu'elles ont au niveau de la société pour pouvoir euh, faire tout ce qu'elles sont, et tous les problèmes qu'elles ont devant elles qu elles, pour faire face à ces problèmes. Donc, la convergence des femmes rurales est une euh, union de coopératives, de 16 coopératives qui regroupe à son sein 827 femmes. Donc cette convergence, elle est créée en 2009 au Mali. Donc elle est, elle est dans huit régions du Mali. Le Mali a huit régions, mais le district de Bamako fait neuf régions. Donc eh, la convergence est représentée dans huit régions et le neuvième région, eh, elle n'est pas représentée là-bas. Cette région dont la convergence se trouve, se trouve à 400 km de la capitale de Bamako, qui est le sud du Mali, à Sikasso. Les femmes rurales, elles utilisent les ressources naturelles pour nourrir leurs familles et puis ensuite pour générer des revenus. Mais elles ne sont pas associées à la gestion. Quant à la gestion de ces ressources naturelles, les femmes rurales ne sont pas associées. Et au Mali, les femmes rurales, elles sont toujours les gardiennes des semences. Et si on dit que les femmes rurales sont les gardiennes des semences, c'est elles pendant les, le moment des semis. C'est elles qui gardent les semences et puis on demande aux femmes rurales, c'est elles qui amènent les, les semences, on les plante. Et puis quant à la, au choix des, euh, des semences au niveau du champ, c'est elles qui font le choix des semences et puis ensuite elles les gardent pour euh, l'hivernage prochain pour la semis. Donc, 
Donc, les produits forestiers aussi et agricoles, par exemple, nous plantons les arbres. Les femmes rurales ne faisaient pas la plantation des, des arbres, mais maintenant on fait la plantation des arbres. C'est pour protéger l'environnement et c'est pour aussi le bois que nous utilisons, c'est pour aussi remplacer ce que nous avons coupé au niveau de la forêt. Donc on dit que les femmes sont les gardiennes des semences. La cause, c'est que c'est la sélection qui se fait au niveau des champs. Les femmes font la sélection des semences. C'est elles qui viennent regarder les semences au niveau des champs pour voir quelles sont les, les bonnes épis qu'il faut mettre ensemble pour eh, pouvoir garder au fond de la maison dans les Canaries et pour pouvoir eh, enlever ça pendant la saison des pluies pour la plantation. Donc nous produisons aussi de la compost. C'est les femmes qui font la production des composts au niveau des familles. Nous faisons des petits trous au niveau de la maison et puis on balaye la cour et puis on met les, les ordures ensemble et puis on met dans les trous. On essaie de, 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 de les garder et de mettre de l'eau chaque fois avant que l'hivernage n'arrive pour pouvoir avoir de la fertilité pour les champs. Je vais vous parler de quelques succès que nous, en tant que Cofersa, on a eu à faire avec les femmes rurales. Et le premier succès, c'est que tout le monde sait que les femmes rurales n'ont pas accès à la terre ni à sa propriété. Mais au niveau de la Cofersa, nous avons fait en sorte que nous avons eu à acheter des terres, même à avoir les titres provisoires avec nous, 7 hectares. Et ces hectares, on l'a eu grâce au plaidoyer qu'on a mené au niveau du gouvernement du Mali pour pouvoir avoir ces terres. Et puis, on a planté des pieds de carité aussi, eh, environ 10 000 pieds de carité. Les femmes rurales ont planté ça pour la protection de l'environnement. Ensuite, nous avons formé les femmes rurales à la eh, fabrication des foyers améliorés. Et les foyers améliorés, comme Marie Robinson vient de dire, les foyers améliorés, c'est pour protéger la femme contre la chaleur du feu qui, qui se lève pour, pour qu'elle ne tombe pas malade. C'est pour protéger les enfants aussi, pour qu'ils ne se mettent pas dans le feu. Donc, on a formé 100 femmes rurales cette année même. Et ces 100 femmes rurales qu'on a formées, chaque femme rurale a fait un foyer amélioré dans sa famille. Et puis là où elle se trouve, au niveau de la localité où elle se trouve, s'il y a un maire, elle part fabriquer le foyer amélioré chez le maire. Ensuite aussi, le chef de village, elle part fabriquer le foyer amélioré chez le chef de village. Les écoles aussi, comme on n'a pas de centre de formation pour les femmes, on a l'habitude de se former et au niveau des écoles, on a construit des foyers améliorés aussi au niveau des écoles pour que les, les enfants puissent se servir avec ces foyers. Ensuite, chez les préfets aussi, là où il y a les préfets, les femmes rurales, elles ont construit des foyers aussi chez les préfets. Donc, ça veut dire que les 100 femmes formées ont fait 100 foyers plus les foyers du maire, du préfet, de l'école, des maternités. Parce que les maternités, les femmes savent que pendant l'accouchement, ils ont besoin de l'eau chaude. Donc, elles ont fait des foyers améliorés au niveau des maternités. Nous avons formé aussi, euh, si tu regardes un peu l'expérience de la COFERSA, euh, pendant euh, quelques années, on a formé 60 femmes rurales en leadership. Donc, c'est 60 femmes formées en leadership. Aujourd'hui, on peut dire qu'il y a des femmes qui sont devenues des conseillères au niveau des mairies. Il y a des femmes qui, ont, qui sont dans les prises de décision au niveau des localités, au niveau de la région et même au niveau national. Il y a des femmes qui sont, les femmes rurales qui sont au niveau des prises de décision là-bas. Donc chaque année, nous en tant que femmes rurales, 
on a un bureau, mais on est tous femmes rurales. On n'a même pas des employés et en tant qu'employés qui nous aident à faire tout ce que nous faisons. C'est nous-mêmes, nous faisons nos programmes, nous cherchons nos financements. Donc, on a, chaque année, on arrive à mobiliser 20 millions eh, de francs CFA qui correspondent à 40, 40 000 US dollars. Donc, nous arrivons à mobiliser ça pour faire eh, nos formations et tout ce qui est eh, comme besoin au niveau des familles rurales. Donc, on, on collecte ça au niveau des ONG du gouvernement, des ONG nationales, des ONG néerlandais et puis des ONG américains. Donc, des leçons à tirer. Comme leçons à tirer, il faut que les femmes rurales qui, qui, qui ont des organisations et puis qui sont déterminées à aller vers les autorités, il faut que nous soyons clairs dans ce que nous faisons, dans la prise en compte de nos besoins pour que les autorités puissent prendre nos, euh, nos besoins en compte. Il faut que les structures de femmes rurales soient déterminées à relever le défi et à honorer l'engagement. Parce que si on part vers les autorités et puis qu'on cherche les financements, il faut que nous aussi, on arrive à gérer ces financements et puis on arrive à avoir de l'impact à, à, à ce que nous voulons. Il faut développer aussi des stratégies claires. Des stratégies claires, c'est quoi Pour avoir l'accès individuellement et collectivement à la terre cultivable. Comme on a déjà dit, on a eu à avoir 7 hectares de terre, dont on a les titres provisoires aujourd'hui. Je sais qu'en 2013, on aura les titres définitifs qui sera notre terre propre. Il faut utiliser des stratégies d'utilisation des ressources naturelles dans le cadre de la souveraineté alimentaire. Comme j'ai dit, la COFERSA, c'est une organisation qui qui fait le combat pour la souveraineté alimentaire. Donc, avoir des stratégies claires pour le développement de la souveraineté alimentaire par la pratique de l'agroécologie. Nous faisons l'agroécologie en format. On a même des relais de femmes en agroécologie qui, qui arrivent à former d'autres femmes dans la production des composts, dans... Euh, dans euh, et je vais dire, dans la protection des, des sols aussi, elles font la formation avec d'autres femmes. Donc, la production biologique aussi des fruits et légumes, de l'élevage et de la volaille. Donc, il faut que les, les structures des femmes rurales soient autonomes, fortes, pour réaliser et pérenniser les actions que nous sommes nous sommes en train de mener. Donc, comme message fort, donc je vais euh, livrer. Donc, ce que nous attendons et ce que nous soutenons, les femmes rurales jouent un rôle fondamental dans l'utilisation des ressources naturelles. Elles doivent être impliquées à la gestion parce que j'ai dit que nous ne sommes pas impliqués dans la gestion des ressources naturelles, mais nous, nous, nous les utilisons et puis nous les préservons aussi. Donc, notre euh, droit doit être reconnu à tout le monde pour dire que nous sommes vraiment en train de protéger les ressources naturelles. L'agriculture paysanne euh, écologique peut nourrir les communautés. Il faut la soutenir, parce que nous, nous croyons que ça peut nourrir la communauté. Donc, il faut... Et, et, et la soutenir. C'est la souveraineté alimentaire, notre combat. Il n'est pas question de produire bio pour l'exportation, mais pour fournir une alimentation saine et durable dans nos familles et puis dans nos communautés. Les femmes rurales bien organisées peuvent produire, transformer, commercialiser les produits locaux à l'intérieur de leur pays et puis aussi à l'extérieur des pays, l'air doit, doit être reconnu. Il faut protéger nos marchés locaux de l'importation de produits mauvais 
pour la santé, l'environnement et l'économie. Donc, j'ai quelques recommandations à livrer. Euh, notre recommandation, c'est appuyer les femmes rurales à disposer d'une organisation forte, les représentant valablement dans les structures de décision de gestion des ressources naturelles. Comme j'ai dit, qu'ils ne sont pas associés à la gestion des ressources, ressources naturelles. Appuyer les initiatives des femmes rurales à tous les niveaux pour la pérennisation et la préservation des ressources naturelles. afin d'assurer une alimentation saine et suffisante sur le sur les présent et sur la génération future. Donc nous, nous pensons que si on nous appuie à faire la production euh, des aliments euh, agro, en agroécologie pour nourrir euh, les populations, c'est pour la population présente et puis la population future que nous allons assurer la nourriture propre et saine. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Um, and we, we, we heard uh, a little bit about um, the need for advocacy with the proper authorities. And, and I would say I think part of uh, the Club de Madrid is also um, recognizing that the proper authorities also need to be able to be open to that advocacy on behalf of rural women and find the channels and the avenues that their voices can be heard when they come and, and advocate, advocate for their own rights as well. Um, so we'll now turn to, to Catherine Lucy from Solar Sisters who can give us a little bit of a, a um, perspective, I think, tying in some of the themes that we've mentioned in terms of rural farmers, because I understand, Catherine, that your work with Solar Sister actually works predominantly with women entrepreneurs who are also um, in agricultural production, but focusing on, coming back to Mary's points about uh, access to energy, focusing on helping them to become the means by which uh, rural households um, get access to electricity. So perhaps you could give us a few short remarks about uh, your work with, with Solar Sister, and particularly your recommendations on how we can be tying in and bring all these threads together of, 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 of access and advocacy, of food security, and access to energy um, at the local level. Thank you so much, Rochenda. This is uh, such a pleasure to be here today and, and speaking to you. Um, I'm here speaking today not from a position of power or a position of policymaker, but really um, from the simple position as a woman and an entrepreneur. Um, I am um, the founder of an organization called Solar Sister, which is working in East Africa with women entrepreneurs, training them, recruiting, training, and support them to be the access points for energy, clean energy for their communities. And so the women are um, working directly in their communities selling small micro solar such as solar lamps, cell phone chargers, small home systems, and we're training the women in technology and in business so that they are the ones who are available to build out this network of access so that people living in um, communities that have no access to power, no access to electricity power, um, are able to, for themselves, provide that. And um, from the work that I've done, I think the, the lesson that I have learned, the most important lesson I've learned that I'd really like to share with you today is that energy is a gender issue. That at the household level, it is women, as, as we just heard, it's women who manage the natural resources, it's women who manage the energy usage. And when we're talking about um, scaling up development and really helping farmers and communities um, live their lives at, at a um, in order to support their families, they need access to energy. It's one of the most fundamental inputs that you can have in order to bring your life um, up to a, a level beyond just subsistence. And so in order to have that access to energy, one of the most important things is that as we hope and support and so many policies are geared towards bringing people and developing communities and developing people's lives, they will need more energy, and as they do develop, they will demand more energy. And one of the biggest, um, the biggest changes that we can make is, is what energy are they going to use as they begin to develop. And it's, it's not only just as a development of, of um, the people and, and their 
prosperity, but it's also as the population grows, the, the demand on energy resources is just going to increase and increase. And so helping them by having ways to choose clean energy rather than um, fuels that are depleting our environment is an important, um, important policy that can be put in place. Um, Solar Sister is a very, very action-oriented, we're a grassroots organization, we work right in the communities, and, and so what we're doing is something that is um, very immediate. We're giving them access on an immediate basis. They can make a choice today that instead of burning kerosene or instead of uh, buying, collecting or buying um, wood or charcoal for inefficient stoves or three stone fires, they can make a choice today to invest in technology that's available, appropriate, rugged, and, and right there now in their community to use, whether it's a solar lamp or an improved cook stove. The market for energy, off-grid energy, is I think estimated to be a $3 trillion market. And that's a lot of money that can be put towards the development of a clean energy market rather than just an off-grid um, traditional fuels market. And so um, Solar Sister is tapping into two great resources that I think every one of your country has, which is you have the natural resource of women. Women who care about their communities, their families, their own prosperity. They have genius in living their lives every day with, within the context and reaching out and trying to improve their lives. And so if you can tap into that resource and give them access to better choices, better choices of energy and better choices of um, markets, then they will work for you in making those changes. And then the other, the other tremendous access that you have is that there is a market already out there. People are already in their homes, even, even at the poorest households, um, are making purchases, purchases of kerosene, purchases of uh, wood or charcoal. And the money that they spend on a daily basis for fuel, for energy, is multiples of what we spend here in the United States for our energy. The cost of kerosene is thousands of times more expensive than the cost of a kilowatt of power off of the grid. And so not only is it, we're, um, not only is it a burden on the household, because these are you know, households that don't have extra money to spend, these are the poorest households, but it's also an issue of, um, you know, it, it just, it's injustice that, that they would be the ones who are spending the most for energy of anyone in the world. And so giving them access to make better choices with their own pocketbooks. And it's a large market, even though it's a very, um, you know, um, small bit by bit market, it's aggregate, a very large market. So tapping into that market and tapping into the resource of women to make good choices, I think can um, make a tremendous difference in how natural resources are, are, um, are used for development and, how, and for prosperity. Thank you. So also government recognizing that in fact that that market exists and is nascent and in some countries and should be supported and as Mary had said, perhaps tying it into social protection programs and maybe people getting a coupon to help them with, with affording the cost of a light or a solution. So, um, and also about about choices for women and having worked in this sector for many years I have to say it's looking at the supply chain as well and it's the women who are the consumers but also we still need to see more women represented. Um, coming back to uh, Prime Minister al uh comments about women quotas but we need more women represented on the boards of the companies that are actually producing and, and deploying these solutions in developing countries as well. So let's move now to, to Jamie um, Bechtel who is the uh, Thank you. Who is the co-founder of, of, of New Course, who I think is going to give us um, a little bit more of a broader perspective on the natural resource management and looking at land and energy and water and bringing us back to the nexus of opportunity for women. Um, so, Jamie, over to you. Great. Thank you. And um, what an honor to be here with you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to keep my comments relatively short because I'm anxious to hear from all of you. Um, New Course is a unique organization. We don't have a solution to provide, interestingly. We are not an agriculture organization. We're not an energy organization. We're not a fisheries organization. We're interested much more in the process 
um, that is behind solutions. I worked for um, 20 years in the environmental field. I worked in over 30 countries, and I was working on over $100 million in investments um, all around the world. And it dawned on me, I had never once gone into a community and met with women and asked women what they needed to manage their natural resources. I went into communities, you meet with the elders, um, you hatch a, a strategy, you set up protected areas. And the unintended consequence of those actions was that the protected areas that were chosen, because the women weren't there to represent their resource use, deprived women of access to natural resources. That had the consequence of driving up poverty and HIV. So here I was mid-career with the realization, maybe, just maybe, I'm doing more harm than good. I had really capitalized on that. I'm a do-gooder and, you know, I, I should keep doing good work. But maybe I wasn't doing good work. So we posed the question, with regards to natural resource management, what happens if you do include women in natural resource management? And what happens if you don't include women in natural resource management? And the data and the statistics that we found were astounding. As I've mentioned, um, there's considerable bad news when you don't include women, but there's considerable good news when you do include women. In India, studies show that if you put three or more women on local forest advisory boards, forest cover goes up by an astounding 75%. Um, it's irrefutable, and so I, I want to just back up and say to you that 60% of the world's poor rely on natural resources for survival and live in ecologically vulnerable areas. That means that their very survival, their only safety net is eroding from out from under them, and we don't have a B plan for them. Importantly, the development community has not recognized this link to the environment, and it is often omitted from development conversations. Likewise, the environment community has not recognized that the majority of the world's poor are women. And, and this gap, this siloed effect, um, permeates every aspect of our work, from what we train our students at university, to the journals that we read, to the lectures that we give. So how can we begin closing that gap? Um, when I was getting my um, dual degrees, I, I was telling somebody the other night, I was getting my PhD and I said, well, I need to know more. I need to know law and policy. Um, and my PhD committee threatened to kick me out of my university because that was not the way PhDs are gotten. That's changing now, but we need to foster cr uh, multidisciplinary approaches. Um, I want to take you just for a moment to the mountains of Tanzania, the eastern Usambara Mountains, where I met a woman named Dodo amazing woman with a spark in her eyes. She has four children. And her husband was very active in the family, a very good provider. He lost his vision to diabetes. Of her four children, her oldest is 12. She walks over a mile to school each way. Um, into a school system in Tanzania right now, the, the chances of being molested if you're a girl are 50%. So here is a woman, who, a young girl, who walks every morning through hazardous conditions to a school system that has hazardous conditions, and she is one of the 5% of students who go into secondary education. Dodo knows that her access to resources means her children will eat today, and Dodo knows that her ability to manage those resources means her children will eat tomorrow. And when asked what she needs, she said education, she said training. This is not unique. The World Bank did a study that only the World Bank can really do these types of studies, um, where they, they interviewed 60,000 people in 100 countries, and the number one response from the rural community was education. Likewise, the World Bank did another study where they looked over 25 years at um, what was the leading indicator for reducing childhood malnutrition. And categorically, it was women's education, more so than food availability. With that notion, um, and based on some of the other comments, I would like to bring into the conversation, in addition to agriculture, fisheries. Fisheries provide one billion people with their primary source of protein. Interestingly, women are a full 50% of the fisheries workforce, 50%, but they don't extract the fisheries, which is where we put most of our investment. They are post-production harvesting. So what happens, coming back to this bifurcation or siloed effect, when we do a conservation measure, we go in and we put a protected area, or we give a, a fisherman an alternative livelihood. 
That takes him off the water. Unfortunately, for every fisherman we take off the water, we have just put two to three women out of work. As a result of this, fisheries have, are the hottest hotspots for HIV right now. So around the world, the baseline HIV rate is four to 14 times greater than in communities that have intact fishing um, resources or agriculture communities or, um, and, and in fact, uh, the, the HIV rate is worse than in prisons, military camps, and all, all of the other areas. So I think when we're talking about food security, um, we need to talk about fisheries, and we need to understand that more fish does not equal more food. That as we look at natural resource management, our presumption is if we return value to the community or the household, that will get the job done. But the way that decisions are made within the household varies, and we need to understand that decision making. We know that women reinvest 90% in their community versus men with 30 to 40%. We know that there are um, separate and secret saving strategies. So a great example, um, we were just recently in Ma uh, Madagascar, and the fishermen said, um, yeah, my wife and I, we share, we share everything, we share our, our income, and she gives me how much money I can spend. And if I don't like how much she gives me, I sell the fish out at sea, and she never has any idea how many fish I actually caught. Um, so we have to understand the bargaining power at the household level if we're really going to take these global policies and these national policies and translate them down into meaningful change on the ground. The last thing that I just want to um, touch on, I've touched on a little bit of the problems, but with regards to the solution set, it, it, it is a complex puzzle, and we tend to show up with solutions with individual pieces of that puzzle. So I think that I bring this up because I think the, the audience here has the ability to foster innovation, um, to take that crazy 12-year-old kid who's come up with a good idea and put him into play or her into play, to really make sure that um, the ideas at the table are a robust set of ideas and not ideas derived from the um, NGO with the best marketing strategy. And I think that innovation will take us far. So in closing, I, I'd just like to say that I'm, a, I'm an optimist, but there is a noose tightening around our earth. And the people with the most nimble fingers, the people who are working in the fields, who are working in the fisheries, who are likely to untie that noose the fastest, we are not giving them a chance at the table. We are not bringing them to bear. We are leaving half of our army out of play. I think we have a huge opportunity to change the game. We just have to get the right players in the game. So thank you, Jamie. Changing the rules of the game, I think, uh, and really reflecting the, the multidisciplinary area. We've heard a, a range of, of panelists um, speaking on the, the multifaceted uh, aspects of women's control of natural resources, all the way from the global human rights uh, issues to um, the, the local levels uh, in the villages, at, at the farms, um, and how women can have a voice in their own uh, management of natural resources. Since we started late, uh, we are going to be able to go a few minutes over um, the, the 10.30 time for the next session. We have one final presentation, uh, which is Rajendra Pachari, the um, head of the uh, uh, Energy and Resources Institute in Terry, who's not able to be with us in person, uh, but has a short video message. So while, while his video is playing, I would encourage you all also to reflect on just the richness of the presentations that has been made, have been made already this morning. And I think rather than having a, a Q&A session among the panelists, I'd like to turn it over immediately after his presentation to bring in the audience and to really help us um, tease out the core recommendations that we want to have reflected from this session um, to feed back into the Club of Madrid um, as we move on from here as well. So if we could uh, roll um, the video next. Thank you very much. Greetings to you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm R.K. Pachori, Director General of Terry and Chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I would have preferred to be with you in person, but I'm terribly sorry that other commitments have not permitted me to join you on this occasion. 
However, let me address the critical issue of ensuring that women's livelihoods and women's place in society bring about a major transformation by which particularly in developing countries we are able to ensure that basic needs of the population can be met. Now I would like to outline three specific initiatives that can make a lot of difference and I believe we have to understand that if we want to bring about a social transformation then that's not going to happen through wishful thinking or by slogans that can be used to bring about women's empowerment. I think it would come about only if we take certain initiatives that alter the entire development scenario in the villages of the developing world. The first one I would like to suggest is programs by which energy access can be ensured. That means providing lighting through technologies that ensure clean, affordable lighting for the poor and of course cooking fuels by which their cooking and space heating needs can be met in a clean manner without polluting the atmosphere inside very small homes. The second area that I would like to highlight is the importance of ensuring that we set up cold chains and agro-processing facilities by which much of the agricultural produce that you see being generated in rural areas of the developing world can be processed and value added. Now this would generate employment and I think the role of women would certainly get enhanced because they would get opportunities through employment to be able to raise their own level in society. And the third area that I would like to emphasize is the need for providing proper access to health facilities and services. And in a large part of the developing world, this is something that unfortunately is neglected. As a result, women who bear a huge burden in terms of carrying out tasks which require physical efforts under very difficult conditions, even things like cooking in the home where you have biomass fuels that produce large amounts of pollution that enters their lungs and causes upper respiratory diseases. The result is that women's health is always a casualty. And I think unless we can put in place institutions and services that ensure proper delivery of health services to women, I am afraid they will always remain in very poor physical condition and therefore they will never be able to rise to their full potential in society. So I wanted to highlight these three initiatives and of course all of this is also important to see that we bring about a transformation towards a sustainable pattern of development which must be an inclusive pattern of development and I think we would be able to do that basically by ensuring that society is much more inclusive, women are given their due place and are able to contribute effectively to the economic well-being of society, particularly in rural areas of the developing world. Overall, I think it is also important to ensure that in poor regions across the globe, we are able to provide education because I am treating education as a cross-cutting theme, not an issue that essentially can be identified as an initiative that would really help women and overall bring about food security across the globe. But just to give you an example, in India we've got certain states where fertility rates have dropped very rapidly, almost dramatically. And that's largely been the result of education of the girl child because women are then able to take fertility decisions which are in keeping with their own well-being and therefore they have fewer children spaced uh, over time and also starting much later in life than in their teens when they often get married early. So I think education is something which is crucial because it will provide people an understanding of technology, of the modern world and the fact that today we are living in an environment where women's status has to be raised and has to be given the, its due because in the absence of that you cannot have stability in society, you cannot bring up children who would also be enlightened because unless the mother is educated, is literate and can impart education to uh, children, obviously the household itself 
will have something missing. So I want to embed education as a cross-cutting theme that sort of supports the three other initiatives which I mentioned. And I think the world has to come up with measures, with institutional arrangements, and certainly large-scale financing by which all of this can be achieved in a reasonable period of time. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful set of discussions and deliberations. So Patchy gives a good summary of some of the themes that have already been uh, raised in this morning's discussion. So we want to turn it over to you. I believe we should have a roving mic um, for um, you to be able to ask your questions. And if I can ask if you can keep your comments or questions fairly short so that we have time um, in the remaining minutes to be able to go through the audience. So the gentleman over here um, uh, had his hand up first. So. Thank you very much. I'm Peter Eigen. I'm the founder of Transparency International. And until a year ago, I was the chairman of uh, EITI, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. I would like to say a few words about other attractive natural resources, the large resources which uh, are a tremendous opportunity for Africa and other developing countries, oil, gas, minerals, and uh, the opportunity to turn these uh, resources into inclusive development. Uh, and, of course, uh, women play a tremendous role in this, both as victims of poor policy and beneficiaries of better policy, but also as actors in creating better policy. And in this connection, I would like to mention the need to create an enabling environment for extractive industry development, which includes environmental issues, includes issues of human development, um, and. Uh, protection of uh, human rights, uh, employment issues, includes issues of uh, um, uh, fiscal sharing of the revenues of, uh, from these large uh, uh, extractive industry ventures, which will give the government the resources to support education, support social services, and uh, improve uh, basically their policies. And all of this, uh, in my opinion, and uh, there are quite a number of other elements uh, of, of sound uh, mining, sound uh, extractive industry development, which are all, by the way, put together in the Natural Resources Charter, which is being put out by uh, uh, Paul Collier and his team at Oxford. And what I'm particularly interested in is to see how one can translate these ideas of um, uh, a holistic approach to good uh, extractive industry development into something which helps uh, the people, the poor, the women who are presently suffering from the resources curse rather than the blessing which uh, resources can represent. And in that sense, uh, I would like to refer to the EITI, which in many countries is being led by women, uh, in particular um, in their multi-stakeholder uh, working groups, uh, like in Nigeria, for instance, where it's led by a woman, uh, Obia Sekwezili, but in many other countries also. So the women have to play a role in which looking at this as a real challenge uh, to uh, make their weight felt uh, at the local level, at the regional level, in Africa in particular, but also at the global level to make sure that uh, these resources also support inclusive development and uh, will not continue what has happened in the past, that they destroy um, societies and uh, uh, damage societies more than they do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I also ask if you have a question, um, because we have the benefit of uh, such a distinguished panel, so I would encourage you if you have a question or a comment specifically to the panelists. Um, um, over here, I think there was a, a hand up. Um, yes, and then we'll come back to the front. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim Aliriani, member of the Club de Madrid. Uh, there is one field of... Uh, financing uh, women to come out of poverty. I'm the chairman of the National Micro Microfinance Foundation. Uh, it's a five years old organization. From my experience, 90% of the customers are women. And 90% of those who return back their loans are women. Men are less interested in microfinancing. At the same time, they are not 
as uh, uh, exact in repaying their loans. Therefore, I believe that microfinancing and micro-microfinancing is a very important field to get women out of poverty. And uh, I must mention that the founder of this activity is Professor Mohammed Yunus of Bangladesh. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I think we recognize microfinance also in terms of helping with bringing access to energy and some of the other services we've, we've mentioned. Um, if we could come now to, to the front. Uh, um. I actually have a question. Oh, oh. Prime Minister, I was amazed at the efforts that you have made to educate the women in your country. And you talked about the books that you had written to try to create, you know, um, a sense of continuity between Islamic uh, principles and equality. Were they effective? Um, did that help any? Um, what has been the attitude since then? And then to President Robinson, I find this interesting and wonderful and frustrating. Um, if cook stoves, I've heard about this now for many years and the effectiveness of it. Why does, what stands behind scaling it up so that the 2.6 billion do use the cook stove? What does it take for Solar Sisters to scale up the energy you know, template that you have created so that it gets bought and implemented in other countries? There is a company that has now made it Potable water, I, I don't know if it was Sudan or some other country, even contaminated water could be made potable so that women and girls don't have to carry it for miles. What, what stands behind the inability to make this global and accessible? Thank and, you. And let's, affordable. Let's, uh, let's uh, come back to uh, uh, Mary Robinson and uh, Prime Minister Al Mahdi to. Uh, uh, to respond to that. Yeah, let, let's, let's uh, yeah. Um, okay. and, and again, particularly as we think of recommendations, um, we have a rapporteur who's taking a copious notes for the session, so we want to come and crystallize a few uh, recommendations from this. Do you want to go first or? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for the question because it is to me uh, the most important question. How do we scale up? And there is scaling up going on. Um, Secretary Hillary Clinton has been very strong with the uh, Cook Stoves Alliance, Milan Bravier, yeah, she's there, at the back of the room, has done a lot of work in championing, but I still think we haven't cracked this. And I do feel strongly that we need um, models of mini credit, and um, the point being made over there, um, that give um, opportunities to those who are the um, recognized poor in the poorest countries who are in social protection systems of different sorts. It's not as if we can't find them. We actually can. We have kind of um, a potential captive audience. Now, why don't they invest in energy themselves? It's something I learned, um, and it's profoundly important that we understand it, that very poor households do not prioritize energy, and as we've heard, spend far too much on energy, on kerosene and candles. They don't prioritize energy because they have so many other prior priorities. So even when there are the cash vouchers in the Ethiopian system, they don't spend it on energy. They need medicines for a sick child. They need school fees. They need so many other priorities. So um, we have to, we, we can't do it by approaching on the basis of energy alone as a separate set. It has to be part of a whole uh, holistic kind of education as part of it, but also we have to um, make it clear in a very acceptable way how important it's going to be to have light in the home, to have clean cook stoves, um, and have schemes for doing that. And there, there are various models, but I haven't seen um, real um, modeling of how to do it um, where we link um, social protection systems and energy. Now, Rachel Kite, whom I've talked to in the World Bank, is exploring this, and they're looking at um, what they do in social protection in a number of countries and whether there are good models for access to energy gadgets. And it'll take a kind of World Bank approach or a major uh, approach of a donor to, to try to have really good modeling of scaling up. But it's what we need, because otherwise, I mean, even the ambition of clean cook stoves is, I think, to reach 100 million, which may sound like a lot, until you realize it's 2.6 billion that we should be talking about 
um, and the predictions for access to energy of the very poor, unless we target them, um, are not good. By 2030, we could still have large numbers without access to clean energy, and that's not acceptable. So uh, I think that your question is, is the real point, and I think if we can, um, you know, I, I would recommend that we, uh, that the Club of Madrid encourage modeling of linking access to clean energy gadgets and social protection systems in different countries and see how we can increase the scale. And just to say, one of the, one of the themes for the um, sustain, year of sustainable energy for all, which uh, has been declared by the United Nations, which is 2012, the Secretary General has said that energy is really the golden thread going through all of these different areas of development and uh, has proclaimed or has encouraged governments to take on uh, achieving universal energy access by 2030 as, as, a, as a commitment uh, uh, by governments and also by the private sector. So we're working on private sector approaches as well. Could I add just one other point about the access to energy for all? I think we must emphasize the all. And again, what I've found interesting was a kind of, um, it's a simplified breakdown, but apparently most people accept it. There are about 500 million people who now have a mobile phone but don't have electricity. And they will be the ones that will be gradually reached, that 500 million, and that's very important. But underneath that, there is 900 million who have neither a mobile phone, nor light in the home, nor clean cook stoves. How are we going to reach them? And I think it can only be by looking at the existing social protection systems and building in access to energy through microcredit, paying for the gadget up front and letting the microcredit um, pay it off. I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, the expert, I'm not the practical expert on the ground, but, but I know that this has to happen. We've got to reach scale, or otherwise it's not going to be access to energy for all. And the poorest will benefit most because they pay too much for energy. It'll save them money apart from anything else, which, which is incredible. And, make, and you know, have, the woman will have time, which is the valuable thing. Not have to go for firewood, not have to go for water, and have time, and, and the children will have light in the home. And as I said, it will help family planning. So, you know, from every point of view, um, I think it's something we should put far more emphasis on. So thank you very much. Where's the negative in all of that? So, um, um, Prime Minister Al Mahdi, uh, there was a specific question about uh, the impact of your your writing, your books, and and your advocacy for for women's inclusion and women's rights. Perhaps you'd like to give a few final comments about uh, um, specifically how how your voice has been taken on board um, in Sudan and, and more broadly, and how you see uh, utilizing that further um, in helping uh, to secure women's rights. Thank you. Yes, I think it has been effective. We are now talking in terms of the need to recognize two objective necessities. One, identity. Two, modernization. And that the two are not mutually exclusive but complementary and that this itself is an Islamic requirement because uh, it is an Islamic requirement because there is a need to recognize reality in terms of the application of any principle and I think this has uh, uh, got now a, a great deal of response in fact now we have called together a uh, conference of like-minded writers and thinkers who uh, believe in this uh, uh, synthesis and uh, I think ultimately it is going to be the way out because as we see things now in many Muslim countries the polarization is going to be seen as a uh, negative, negative uh, formula and that the only win-win formula is the recognition of the two forces as necessary and as complementary. Uh, yes, I believe that it is uh, uh, very relevant and it has now a lot of clout. I want to say a few words about this business of solar energy because uh, I think that this is a very important natural resource. We have now uh, formed a, an environmental NGO that uh, has addressed the summit, the, the environment summit in uh, Norway, uh, in terms of what needs uh, to be done about uh, um, climate justice. Because since then, there has been a lot of uh, 
idea, a lot of thinking about the need for the polluters of the atmosphere to compensate the victims. And we have been saying that, of course, uh, this is necessary, but also we need to see how to use this, uh, uh, such funds. And we've suggested two things. One, the need for afrostigation, because this uh, both tends to uh, uh, defeat the desertification and also the, uh, the, the, the uh, need for the uh, carbon arrest, which is part of uh, resolving and addressing the problem of the emissions. And the second one is the need to uh, apply, we need to apply a lot of research on the use of uh, uh, solar energy so that all domestic, all domestic uh, services be uh, related to this source of energy. Uh, all the uh, domestic uses in for heating, for cooling, uh, for cooking, etc. Uh, we think that this is what we should be thinking about and what we should be planning for. That is afrostigation and the use of solar energy for uh, domestic purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think in conclusion, just as we wrap up, I'd like to take just uh, from our other um, panelists, just their final, um, perhaps in a couple of sentences, their final recommendations um, or comments from the panel. So Catherine, we'll start uh, with you. Okay. Thank you for that comment because I think that is, uh, the, the question is how do we scale? When we do see success, how do we scale it up? And I think um, there, there's two gaps that are keeping some of these um, technologies or some of these solutions from really being scaled at large, across large populations. And one of the gaps is geographic access to the technologies and to the solutions. And so investment in distribution um, is a key investment that needs to be made so that all people have access to these technology solutions that can provide them with clean energy and can um, then, um, you know, improve their lives and also um, make less of a burden on natural resource extraction. And um, that investment in distribution is currently very under-invested. It's, it's one of the most difficult things to invest in because it's not hard and fast. You're not investing in something. You're investing in a system. And so I think that's one of the ways that um, can make a big impact is investment in the distribution systems. And then the other investment that needs to be made is because we are often looking at technology solutions for these problems, there needs to be an investment made in technology education, especially for women, and especially when we're talking about women as being the managers of natural resources. They need to have access to the technologies that can help them manage those resources better. And um, it starts at a very young age that um, you know, we talk about STEM education here in the United States and how important that is, and it's even doubly important when you're talking about uh, understanding technology as being something that either does or doesn't um, give you access to technology that can improve your life. And so I think those, those two recommendations are investment in distribution and investment in technology education for girls especially. Thank you. Uh, Madam Charari, um, a, a couple of final uh, comments from you in terms of recommendations to the group. D'accord. Les recommandations que eh, je vais faire, parce qu'on a parlé beaucoup de l'énergie renouvelable, bon, je pense que ça c'est un problème aussi chez nous, parce qu'il y a le soleil, Et puis, la plupart de nos produits, ça se gâte. On n'arrive pas à les transformer. Alors que le soleil est là, comment utiliser le soleil pour pouvoir sécher ces produits et puis les conserver à, à la nourriture pour l'année? Mais on voit, surtout dans la zone où je me trouve, à Sikasso, c'est une zone de production. Les 80 percent des produits, c'est gâté. Si tu rentres dans les champs, tu vois que le produit est C'est versé par terre et puis ça se gâte parce qu'il n'y a pas moyen de le transformer. Donc quand on parle d'énergie renouvelable, je pense que c'est quelque chose qui touche à nous 
en tant que femme rurale qui faisons la production de ces produits au niveau de nos, de, de nos champs. Donc, euh, euh, je pense que c'est une recommandation à faire. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire envers nous euh, pour que nous puissions utiliser euh, l'énergie solaire pour pouvoir transformer les produits et puis les conserver à la consommation Merci beaucoup. Uh, Jamie, final word. Thank you. Two, two separate points. One is on this issue of scale. One of the things I think we have to pay attention to is managing unintended consequences, um, both positive and negative. So for example, I'm on the cook stove alliance and one of the things we see is as cook stoves are adopted, it has the unintended consequence of reducing ambient light within um, households. Women have to then choose a kerosene or choose a lantern and depending upon which kerosene, which lantern they choose, um, can either drive back up health issues or not. And so as we make these changes, we're going to trigger a series of actions and we have to be aware of that. The flip side is we can really capitalize on that. We're working on a project in East Africa where we're introducing um, solar lights. Um, they're being paid back. And then we put the stipulation very carefully and in, in, in collaboration with the women, instead of paying interest, the women are paying forward three or four months of kerosene being put into a health fund um, so that they um, have some savings to withdraw in case of health emergencies. What they love about that is it ties up the cash and they can blame it on the crazy white lady from the United States as to why they don't have immediate access to the cash so their husbands can't spend it. So there's real opportunities as we look at these chain of events that will be triggered as a result of our actions. Um, and finally, in terms of pure recommendations, at the policy level, um, as I mentioned earlier with academics, um, our, our policy is very siloed. So for example, as of two years ago, there were only 10 ministries of environment that were working on gender mainstreaming. There um, are, are virtually no, uh, it, they're growing, but the inclusion of natural resource management and poverty reduction strategies for countries is still very small. And in fact, with regards to the implementation of 1325, there's only one country that includes natural resource management in its action plan, and I believe that country is Norway. But here we have a situation where we know women are instrumental to peace and security. We know wars are increasingly being fought over natural resources management, or natural resources, as many as 40%, but none of us are, are closing that nexus and in, including it in policy considerations. Thank you very much. I, I, I understand we have to conclude now, but I want to give Mary the last word, just in conclusion. So. Yeah, just to pick up on uh, Peter Eigen's point, um, which I think is a very uh, valid one, because uh, a number of African countries in particular are finding huge um, resources now of gas and oil, etc. I had a very interesting conversation in Doha with the Minister of Environment of Mozambique, who is very strong on gender, very strong on um, you know, a, a, a good food security, food and nutrition security, bottom-up development, etc. And she is now coping with the other side, which is how um, in exploiting the resources, it will be done in a way that is inclusive, that, it, uh, you know, that is appropriate, etc. So um, Paul Collier's charter is all the more important. I just want to emphasize that. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to all of our um, speakers and uh, panelists uh, this morning. Um,